those of you who don't know me, I'm Adrian. I, um, I'm attached to the material science or the metallurgy and materials school at the University of Birmingham. I'm involved there as an entrepreneur in residence to help uh, academics and students think about commercializing their ideas. So um, it's great to be involved in helping with this particular initiative where you are looking to pitch your ideas and in particular pitch these ideas in the Ronjan Nag entrepreneurship competition and hopefully win the prize. So what I want to do today is um, go through just a few little things. So first of all, I do actually do an undergraduate lecture for the materials school um, on pitching. It's one of their actual exercises where they have to learn um, why it's important to pitch and also have a practice. So I've borrowed a bit of that uh, material for today's session. Um, and what I wanted to do is make it a little bit more than just pitching specifically for competition, because with any luck, um, you know, this won't be the only time that you pitch. And hopefully what you learn today um, will also be useful in other circumstances. So as part of today's session, what we're going to do is talk very, very briefly about what we mean by a pitch. For those of you that aren't maybe so sure, um, what it is we need to do to make an effective pitch. What I also want to do is talk about uh, the constraints of a pitch. Usually you, you do have constraints and in this particular competition there are constraints, so we'll talk about those as well. A little bit about the structure, how to make it an effective pitch, and also some of the different types of pitches you might uh, be involved with as well. So as you saw in what he was just talking, he was very engaging, he was very succinct, in what he was trying to get across. In other words, he didn't waffle and he got his point across very strongly with an enticement. He was, he was selling something that somebody wanted. He was very clear with what was on offer. Um, he was very engaging and he didn't beat about the bush in the sense that he was very focused on what he was offering to his potential customer. Um, and actually people study this kind of sales technique in more time that we're going to do here because of course sales is an art as well as a science some people are very good at sales some people aren't but sales is pitching and I think this is the key thing when you're going to stand up um, and do your pitch you're selling yourself and your potential idea your potential company um, to the panel and what you need to do is engage them a little bit like the previous pitch in the sense that you've got to make them really enthused by what you have on offer and stand apart from everyone else. And of course that was staged in Hollywood, but you saw the effect of everybody around him listening and to see whether he was successful. And they were also pulled in to the story that he was telling. So this is the mindset that you've got to go into with a pitch is you've got to be razor sharp focused on getting your point across um, and be very clear what it is you're selling or what it is you're pitching. Okay, I'm gonna show you another pitch now. Okay, so that was an example of a little bit more of a fun pitch, but I think the key there is, you know, that was an example of Ali G pitching a crazy idea. And what you're gonna be doing, of course, is standing up and pitching an idea, something new, hopefully, something novel, something engaging. Now, of course, Trump is a, is a businessman and he doesn't have a lot of time. Uh, he was pretty impatient in that, in that clip. Uh, he was pressing for the, the pitch to hurry up. He wasn't overly impressed and he had other things to do. And this is often the case when you make a pitch, is that your constraint is your time, and getting the point across quick enough um, and in a way that draws the audience in, given that they're gonna be really pressed. And this is why we talk about an elevator pitch, actually, because you've only got a certain amount of time to do it before the elevator reaches the top. And in an office building, that's when you're kind of making your pitch uh, to the manager or the investor. Okay, so, just to sort of set the scene about when you might be making a pitch, because I think, you know, when I talk about this with the undergraduates, of course, what they're actually doing is thinking where else they might use this skill. But I think also it's important that when you're standing up to do the kind of pitch you're preparing for, that you realize that there's a lot of synergy to other things you're already doing. So one of the, one of the problems with making a pitch is nerves. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pressure situation. You've only got a short period of time to get your point across. And so the more you practice your pitching, the better. And also the more you realize that you're actually doing pitching a lot in your everyday life for different types of circumstances will also help. 
So as I've written here, when do you kind of make a pitch? Of course, when you're making a sales pitch, when you're selling a product or service, and that might be an element that comes out in what you're going to be pitching um, in this competition. You will also be pitching when you make an, uh, a job application or interview. And certainly for the undergraduates that I talk about this with, this is one of the reasons why it's important to prepare a pitch. Um, and then classically, you're making a pitch when you're trying to raise investment or funding for your business, the kind of dragon's den um, or the apprentice type pitching. Um, and increasingly, as I've written here, you will find as you go through life um, trying to win contracts that you will be expected to do all kinds of pitching. So for example, in science and technology with Innovate UK here in the UK, often when you're putting in a science or technology bid, you actually have to do a video pitch as part of the process. And what they're looking for there is exactly what we would expect in pitching. It's a succinct way of getting across what you're trying to do, partly because dissemination of the project work is important in the future. So they're looking to see how well you come across at the pitching stage and how you differentiate yourselves from your competition. So this kind of pitching process is becoming more and more common. And sometimes it's pre-recorded and sometimes it's live. Okay, so what I want to do now is show you an example elevator pitch, the kind of thing I think that you might be doing um, in the competition in the sense that this is now pitching an idea potentially for some investment. My name is Josh Light and I'm the CEO of CupAd and we believe that we have the most effective form of advertising available in the market today. Our advertisements are exposed to customers for 2,220 seconds on average. Now what kind of advertising has that kind of exposure time? Ladies and gentlemen, we advertise on coffee cups. That's right, we put your brand in their hand. So how does coffee cup advertising work? Well, we got an advertiser. They pay us money. We produce paper coffee cups with their advertisement or brand on it. Then we give these coffee cups to coffee stands for free. Now, why does someone want to advertise on a coffee cup? Because it takes an individual 37 minutes to drink a cup of coffee on average. That person's going to have to look at the cup, drink, look at the cup, drink 20 times before it's fully consumed. And that person's going to move around like a mobile billboard, exposing that brand to at least six different individuals before that cup is drank. Why does cup, what's in it for cup ad? We make 13 cents of profit on every single cup that we distribute. And what's in it for the coffee stands? Well, when most people think about coffee stands, they think about Starbucks. But what about the 25,000 coffee stands in this nation? that have plain white cups like this. They don't, they don't have the economies to scale to put their own brand on the cup. So we give them free cups. They save $15,000 a year by not buying cups. They like these savings so much, ladies and gentlemen, that approximately 80% of the stands that we've con contacted have signed exclusivity agreements to distribute our cups. And what kind of momentum have we started for this company? In the last month alone, we got 58 coffee stands in California to sign exclusivity agreements with us to distribute our cups. If we continue to get 58 coffee stands every single month for the next 12 months, we will have 700 coffee stands at the end of the year. With 700 coffee stands, we can move 8 million cups a month. And at 13 cent profit, 8 million cups a month, we're making over a million dollars a profit every single month and we've already started this ladies and gentlemen in fact our first customer overstock.com will see their cups hit the california market in 21 days thank you very much so yeah i mean it was the winner of the competition i selected it because it was indeed supposedly a good pitch um, it resonated with the audience um, but it was also a good example i think of the kind of thing that you're preparing yourself um, to do so uh, I don't know how much of that you can remember because of course he was constrained by time and he rattled through what he was talking about. Um, but he did get in there an incredibly large amount of information in that short period of time. Hopefully you came away understanding the product that he was offering, why it was a little bit different, the value proposition as we call it, um, and why somebody might be interested to invest because he had all kinds of statistics. He was talking about customers signing up. He was talking about some of the metrics. He managed to squeeze in even his predicted uh, or projected profitability. So, um, you know, it ticked a lot of boxes in terms of uh, covering the ground. Now, there's always a difficulty in being too quick and sort of blasting at the audience all kinds of facts and figures that none of them are going to retain versus being a little bit steadier so that they go away having soaked in what you're talking about. So we'll go through a little bit of this as we go. But what I do want to do is show you some examples like this so that if nothing else, you can see what other people um, are doing. So as I said, you know, one of the big problems with the pitch are the constraints. And, um, you know, usually it's time limited. That is by far the biggest 
um, constraint. And what that means is you simply run out of time before you've covered what you want to say. And one of the big problems with that is if you haven't practiced and you haven't thought about what you want to say, then the important stuff, and we'll come to that in a minute, gets left out. And so your audience, your potential investor, et cetera, uh, goes away with an incomplete picture and doesn't really know what it is that you are offering. The other part of the constraint is what I call here the place. You know, it, it, it will be constrained by the, the, the way that the pitch is set up. So it could be a live audience, it could be a panel audience, it could literally be in an elevator going up multiple stories. Um, you could be constrained by um, the size of the audience and all kinds of things. So the place is an important part. And one of the key things here is, is because you tend not to control all of this, um, it can also affect your nerves, your concentration, your confidence and so forth. And then the other thing is the manner, which is linked slightly to the place. It's the way that it's, it's projected and the way that it's pitched. So is it going to be online? Is it going to be face to face? Is it with a group? Um, are you going to have some interaction or is it just a straightforward one way flow of information? So, of course, the whole problem with pitching is, is, as I've said here, it's high stakes. You tend to only get one opportunity, one chance to make a success of it. And, um, you know, you're often either the winner or you're not. So, you know, there's sometimes no consolation prize. And that's what builds up the stress and makes it all that more difficult. And you can imagine, you know, if you're going for a job interview for pitching or you are going for that big round of investment when you're trying to um, raise money for your business, those are really high stress instances. And so entering competitions like this is a really good, good way anyway, because apart from anything else, it builds confidence and it just gives, gives practice. These are some of the constraints relating to the competition. So it is only a five minute pitch and um, that is not very long, but with practice, you will be amazed how much you can squeeze into that. And what's interesting with this pitch is that it's actually going to then have twice as long, 10 minutes for engagement questions and answers from both the panel and the audience. So there will be more people in the audience than just the panel who you're pitching to. Um, and all of them can ask questions. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, it's a virtual event. So you won't, as far as I know, um, unless things change very drastically in the next few weeks, you won't be sort of in the actual room where you can sense what's going on. And that can be a real uh, disadvantage because you won't have that eye to eye contact. and You won't have the body language of the panelists looking at you in the same way as you would with a live event. So that's what I mean by some of the constraints and some of the issues. Um, in this particular case, it will be live. It won't be a pre-recorded pitch. Uh, there will be four finalists. And what's interesting is that there will be a vote that includes the audience to lead to two semi-finalists, and then it's a panel that decides. So uh, what this means is that you really do have to address your pitch beyond just the panel. You have to engage the whole audience and be relevant to them as well. It is high stakes in the sense that it's £5,000 prize and there is only one prize. But I think the important thing to understand with this particular example is that the people in the room could be really influential even if you don't win. Um, there could be other venture capitalists, there could be other investors, there will probably be a broad network of alumni, people connected with the competition, etc. all of whom could help you even if you're not the winner. And so it's really important to still, as part of your pitch, talk to them in the sense that hopefully some of them will get back to you and maybe take your idea forward in some way. So actually, don't think of this as a one all or nothing. Okay? Try and think what else you can get out of it as you go. Okay, I'm going to give you another example of a pitch now. So um, similar sort of thing. This is a business plan competition. It's an elevator pitch. Another winner. Uh, see what you think of this. Two-thirds of adults think that traveling would be a fun way to make friends, yet no major travel provider addresses the social aspect of travel. Not Orbitz, not Expedia, not Travelocity. Travel Blender does. It's like a match.com for friends. Register online for free, tell us about yourself, your ideal travel partners, and where you want to go. Then our unique matching software generates the perfect blend of travel partners, and our travel experts create an unforgettable custom trip. Our revenue comes from commissions on trip sales. Our target is the 68% of adults, 30 to 44, who go on vacation each year. Those who don't enjoy the bar scene or rec leagues, they want to meet people doing things they already like, where they already spend their time and money. With a $50,000 investment, Travel Blender can be cash flow positive in 16 months. 
we estimate 18-fold investor returns by year five. We're Travel Blender. Make friends, go places. I think it was a good pitch. It covered a lot of ground as well, but the pace was different to Josh's. So Genevieve, um, she was going a bit slower. She was a bit more steady with, with the message. She also covered a lot of ground. Um, I think probably she didn't have as many statistics and as much financial information, for example, as the previous uh, example with Josh. But again, a nice, clear pitch. And I think it was clear from that, you know, potentially why she won. As Mohammed's just put in the comments, she used relatable examples. And this is one of the things that is really important. As part of engaging your audience, you've got to try and um, work with them based on what they already understand, yeah? Because you're gonna be presenting a new idea. And if you're presenting a new idea, it's gonna take them a bit of time to comprehend what it is you're talking about. So exactly this, the fact that she used an example to relate to that people had heard of is a really good way of setting the scene and the context. And that means you can cover a lot of ground more quickly because you don't have to describe all the features. You're just saying it's like something else that people know in a different area. Um, so that's a, that is a powerful technique. I just wanted to cover this very quickly because as part of the thinking with pitching, um, you know, the thing that you're going to be doing in the competition is, is probably off the cuff spoken pitch in the sense that it's going to be hopefully rehearsed, but you're expected just to get on and do it um, to an extent, maybe as part of a presentation. So you might, might well have some slides or something um, to refer to, depending on um, how you want to do this and, and what, the, what the facilities are. Notice that the previous two didn't use slides. Um, they literally were using themselves to engage. And when it's a very, very short pitch like this, this I think um, is, is important because the last thing you can do is start flicking around slides and so on. So in a very short pitch, the presentation at most would probably be one or two slides and those would be very pictorial. So they might be your logo or they might be a picture of your product, etc. Reason I highlight all of this is have a think when you're doing your pitch, how might you adapt it to these other media? particularly if you get follow-up and people want to know more, because then you're actually extending your pitch uh, and, and carrying on that process. Okay, I've got a couple of slides here just to show you a little tiny bit of theory related to um, pitching, just to show that there is some science behind it. And all I wanted to show you here is that you can kind of talk about the pitching process as a kind of a communication system. Um, and the important thing is in a communication system, there are several components, okay? You have the information that you actually want to communicate that's going through and that's your signal and that's going to a destination who's gonna be listening to what you're saying. And unfortunately, in all communication systems, there is noise okay, that gets in the way. Now, in a radio, it's that buzz that you hear in the background when it's not particularly well uh, tuned in or as you transition from one cell to the next on a mobile phone. What does all this mean in terms of a presentation? So basically, as I've labeled on this slide, okay, you've got the information source, which is gonna be you, all right? And you're selling something, in this case, your idea. Um, you're gonna transmit it in a particular way. So in the competition that we're talking about, it's gonna be some kind of live Zoom, I'm assuming, pitch. Um, it's going to be short for, for five minutes, and you are actually presenting, as I said, to a panel, a bit like an interview board, an investment panel, and an enlarged audience, okay? And they are all decision makers, okay? And they are the ones that are gonna decide who wins. And unfortunately, in this kind of scenario, there is an awful lot of distraction. Um, things won't work technically. People will have problems with their sound, as we've even had today. They're all kind of distractions because they're not all in the room watching you. Perhaps they're sitting at home or they're on a panel remotely, etc. So all of these things are going to distract. Now, in a long presentation like this one, a little bit of distraction here and there is not an issue because you can pick up the thread. But in a short pitch, any distraction means they might, move, might not catch that key message. So be really wary of what the, the, the noise sources are and try and work with those. In other words, be aware of where things can go wrong so that you get your pitch across um, as, as effectively as possible. 
now talk a little bit about some uh, tips. So this is a video referring to... Have you ever been at a conference, a networking event, or even a party and found yourself tripping over the words when asked, so what do you do? If so, you need to work on your elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is what happens when you distill yourself, your business, or your brand into a soundbite. Think of it as a verbal branding service. A simple, memorable, and short speech you can bust out anytime someone asks you about your work. Here are a few tips for upping your elevator pitch game. Keep it simple. Focus on the main event you provide to clients or customers and save the numbers and technical jargon for the investors. Keep it short. 60 seconds is the absolute longest your elevator pitch should be. In the best case scenario, your elevator pitch should only be a few powerful sentences. Remember, your elevator pitch shouldn't tell your whole story. It should make your listener want to know your story. Keep it relevant. The more you can tailor your elevator pitch to the person you're talking to, the better. Keep a few elevator pitch examples in your head so you can mix and match them depending on the situation. If you need ideas to get started, look online for an elevator pitch template and just fill in the blanks. Good luck. Those are some tips for an elevator pitch, which is you know a shorter one minute kind of pitch. But the key thing is that you're gonna have a little bit longer in your pitch to get some things out but not much longer. And so, as I say, the important point is to follow some of these advice um, pointers. Now, the other thing is, is that your pitch, I hope, is not gonna be the only one. So, in a normal situation, you might make that pitch to the panel, but you would also um, you know, be networking afterwards and, and so forth. Now, that might be slightly different in the, in the pandemic situation, but the point is, is that you will then meet lots of people um, over the ensuing period where you will need to make an elevator pitch of what you are um, pitching for the five minutes. So as you're preparing um, for this competition, if you do expect to take it further, whether you win or not, also think about this elevator pitch. Um, as you saw on the video, the thing there is you never know when you're going to bump into someone who you could explain it to quickly without boring them, where they could go, I know someone that would like that, or I can help you with that, or whatever. And that sort of one minute summary, which gets the point across, is a really, really important skill. And, and it's a powerful thing to have. Um, and if you do go into business and you do you know, follow this sort of entrepreneurial route, over time, you'll get more and more practiced. And as was shown in this video, you'll have more than one elevator pitch. You'll have a pitch that's more tuned for the investor. You'll have a pitch more tuned to a customer and so forth. Um, and that's perfectly fine. And you'll be able to adapt which one you use. Now. For the competition, the five minute one, you're going to have probably, it'll be a bit of a mish, mishmash of the two in the sense that you've got a bit longer, but your audience is more diverse as well. So you want to engage with a slightly broader demographic. Right then, so just to summarize some pitching tips. Um, first of all, a lot of successful pitches actually come down not just to the idea, but to who is delivering the idea. Yeah, it's a, it's, it is a well known fact that people are taken in by people. So, of course, how you present yourself or how your team presents themselves is really, really important. Um, you need to be professional. You need to be looking, you know, tidy. Um, and it's all down because what actually happens in a pitch is the people listening are thinking, is this person honest? Is this person someone I can work with? Has this person got a similar sort of outlook to life as me? In other words, you know, would I get on with them if I had to work with them? And so forth. So I put a few things here that I think are important. Obviously, when you pitch, you do need to be yourself. Don't try and be something you're not. But more importantly, you've got to be focused. You've got to come across as organized because if you're organized in your pitch, you will probably be organized when you take it forward as a business idea. And that's really what the investor or the panel is looking for. Um, clearly, you need to be polite. It's very bad to become very defensive or aggressive with a pitch. Um, it's not a bad thing to disagree uh, if you have time. Obviously, in the pitch itself, it's unlikely, but in the question and answer session, you might be able to disagree, but you need to be able to disagree politely and say why your particular point is the way it is or why perhaps they're wrong. Um, you also need to be truthful, both in the pitch and when you're answering the questions, partly because it always comes back to bite later, but also by being truthful at that point, um, when, the, when the pitch progresses to maybe an investment, uh, it'll be vitally important that there are no problems that could derail it. 
confidence is really important in a pitch. All the pitches we've looked at, I think you've seen, they've come across as confident. Now, not everybody is naturally confident, but a lot of confidence comes about through just practice, as you'll see in a minute. Um, and then the other thing is passionate. Usually people that pitch something are passionate about what they're pitch pitching. In other words, they're engaged in it. They think it's the next best thing. Um, so it would be quite unusual to pitch something that you're not passionate about, yeah? particularly in this kind of entrepreneurial spirit. So the content then, what should you get in the content? You should only put in the essentials, okay? And what you're really trying to do, as you've seen with these other pitches, is put in enough to be convincing that there's something really interesting there to then fuel the questions, particularly in this competition where there is 10 minutes of question and answers. You want the audience to think, huh, I didn't know that, I'm gonna ask a bit more about that. Well, that's really interesting, what about this? So this is, this is one of your aims, is to get the audience asking questions. Because if the audience asks questions, the panel will start to see that actually what you've pitched is something really interesting, it's engaging. So that in itself is gonna be a positive point. So no questions at, at the end of a pitch could be a bad thing, yeah? It's not that you've answered everything, it's impossible to answer everything in five minutes. I do think it's important to include a bit about the strategy and the pricing or the plan. Now it does depend if your idea is a commercial idea with a price and a, and a profitability type thing like we saw with Josh, or whether at this point it's more of a concept that you want to take forward. Um, so clearly that does depend exactly on what you're pitching, but there should be something in there that shows that it can go forward as an idea, either that it's commercially viable or that it's easy to do or that it's, it's something that people will want. It's got a unique selling point. Okay, and whatever it is you pitch, you know, there will be people in the audience almost certainly that know the market you're thinking about or will know the technology you're talking about and so on. In other words, there will be people in the audience who are potentially experts as well. So you do need to make sure when you talk and pitch about something, you're using what I've termed here the right terminology. So make sure you do know your stuff. Um, what you've got to be careful about is not using terminology so that it excludes people that don't know what you're talking about. Yeah? So you've got to be a bit careful about that, um, but use the right terminology so that the one or two experts in the audience go, ha, oh, yeah, they know what they're talking about. And now this is more difficult, as I said, when it's an online type situation, but you do need to be responsive. And so I think people that pitch well, read their audience well. They feel the room, if that's where they are, or they, they understand who they're talking to in the elevator. They're kind of engaging, um, they're, they're emotionally alert to what people are thinking. So the, the point here is to try and be responsive to this. If you see people looking to start to ask a question um, and it's the right time to ask them to ask the question, that's the sort of thing you can do. You need to adapt to your audience. Now in a very short pitch, that's difficult. Um, but as you carry on with your elevator pitching and you maybe pitch the idea into the future, these will be skills that will be really helpful. I want to show you this one. Um, this is a Dragon's Den pitch. Uh, Mark Champions a few years ago um, made this interesting pitch. So see what you think of this one. Uh, the way he set out was to list some of his achievements. He tried to get people on board that he was an expert in what he's done, that he's already had some success. And one of the other key things with his pitch is that he had props. So he had his products with him. Um, and that's a really effective way of engaging with people. Uh, and as you saw right at the end there, he actually gave some out to the, the panel to have a look at and to take away. And that instantly makes the panel feel, you know, great. They've got a gift. They can have a look at what's, um, what's on offer. Now, in your competition pitch, you may not have the product but I would strongly recommend that you have some kind of prop that, that links to your product or illustrates your product because that is instantly more engaging than if you do not. Um, and if you think back to those earlier pitches that we looked at, they were just spoken. Um, apart from Josh at the beginning, he had his cup that he held up. The kind of structure that might well work, everybody's pitch is going to be slightly different, okay? It's really difficult to say to you, it must be like this because I don't know exactly your ideas. I don't know what your strengths are in terms of how you will come across with these different aspects. But what I do think is a, is a good um, sort of benchmark for some structure to your pitch is you should first introduce yourself clearly. They want to know who you are. Say something about your skill and your experience as to why it is that you're up and pitching. 
Um, and then an organization if you're associated with an organization. So if you've got a company behind you that is part of what you're doing, then that's the time to introduce that as well and say a little bit about what it does. Um, all the time, you've got to think about why something is important, why something is appealing. That's what they're going to be asking, okay? So don't just present facts, talk about why it's the way it is. And you saw that a bit, for example, with Josh when he was talking about you know, cups. The reason why it's important to put things on cups um, is that you know, they're in the hands of lots of people who are going to see them. That's the thing, yeah? He's explaining it a bit more. Then it's a case of going into a little bit more detail about what it is you're doing, what your idea is, what your concept is, and the opportunity that's um, presenting itself. And ideally, show that you've made some progress. So it's not just a case of, here's my idea and I came up with it yesterday and I think it's great. Show that you've done some research, you've produced a prototype, you've asked some people whether they'd buy it, you've got an order in, all of these things that show that what you're doing has real appeal. And then the most important thing about a pitch is say what it is that you want, okay? It's what we call a call to action. There is no point just telling people a load of stuff and they go, well, that sounds great, but what do you want from me? Okay, now, in this case, of course, what you actually want is you want to win the prize. You want them to, um, to, to think that yours is the best product or the best idea to take forward. Um, often in a pitch, it's also about raising investment and it's also about um, getting somebody to, to contact you to buy the product. So even in this competition, you still want to explain that you really want them to get in contact with you. Yeah, because you, if you're unlikely to win the competition, let's say there are lots of people in it, um, out of your time spent preparing and then giving the pitch, the one thing you want is people that really liked what you were doing to get in touch with you. So I would say the call to action for you in this pitch is to make sure that they go away with your website or your email address or some other way of contacting you so that you can carry on with the conversation. I'd love to hear from you if you're working in this area. If you think you could test my idea, please get in contact. If you'd like to invest in my idea, please contact, etc. Okay, So that's the aim there. And I think if you cover all of those points, you'll have a pretty strong pitch. Let's face it, sometimes men just don't understand women. And that's okay, we don't expect you to all the time. But it would be nice if a male who is developing an iPhone app for us understood us better. 10 million female iPhone users have repeatedly shown interest in the app market. But there are two problems here. One, not a lot of apps exist for women. And two, the apps that do exist kind of fall short of the mark. And that's mainly because men are developing them. So our team, we believe that we can connect with this, mis, uh, this dissatisfied and under-targeted market to bring very tailored apps specifically for women. We're seeking a $100,000 investment in exchange for a 25% stake in equity and a 10x return. We'll roll out one app quarterly starting from six months from the initial investment. We expect break even to occur by the end of year one. We're Miss App, we're designing for women, and it's because, well, women like technology too. So another example of a succinct pitch. Hopefully, when you listen to pitches like this as a sort of a critic, the key thing is to come away thinking, did I understand what the product was? Did I understand why they were better than maybe the competition? What is it that they wanted um, at the end? Um, and how would I get in contact with them? So if you were to go back and look at these pitches now, you'll see that all of them have some flaws in them. Yeah, they don't all, you know, mark all the boxes. Uh, but rest assured that most people, when they pitch, don't get any of them. So, you know, if you can get the majority of the things into your pitch right, come across as confident, um, then you've got a really good chance of succeeding. Okay, planning a pitch. We don't need to go into this in great detail, but this is just a template you can use and a, and a way of thinking about it. Uh, the key thing, I think, is have a kind of a headline. Think of it a bit like a tweet, a sort of a short, snappy introduction of what it is you're trying to get across because that makes you focus in on the, on the, on the, on the sort of the value proposition. Um, think of some key points that you wanna get across in your pitch. These can be what the product is, why you're skilled, all the things we've talked about, um, you know, profitability, finance, how, who's buying it, all of these things. In each case, you will have certain success stories or certain features that are important to your product that you want to get across. That's why there's not a set recipe for this. And then as I say, right at the end, make sure you have your call to action. 
Now, from the last workshop, for those of you that attended, we had uh, quite a lot of discussion about how you think about commercializing your idea. And a lot of that was actually distilling down all the important points of, of what your idea is and how you know, it affects different people, how it interacts with suppliers and customers and so on. And this was one of the slides that I showed, which was kind of all about articulating your ideas, some of the key points to make you think what's, what's going on. Um, so if you did fill this out from the last session um, and you've started to think a little bit about what it is you offer, what your idea is, if it's a business, what the mission and vision is, how ready is it, what can you get out the door first, this minimal viable product, what is it that people want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera then those form really good points for you to use in your presentation. Um, also from that workshop, if you go through the slides and you think about um, what it is in there that people might want to hear from you in a pitch, some of the things that I think are really important are obviously the strengths and the opportunities from your SWOT analysis. So when you've done your strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, threats analysis, you don't want to elaborate too much on your weaknesses and your threats in your pitch. What you want to do is emphasize your strengths and opportunities. Uh, if you've done the attractiveness map, then you'll be looking at those quick wins and those gold mines because those are the things that people are going to be most interested in in your pitch. If you've thought about IP and you're going to protect some or you've even filed some um, protection for your intellectual property, that might go into your pitch. Has a customer already said they'd like to buy something when it's ready or maybe even made an order? That's an excellent thing to put in a pitch. The LOI there is a letter of intent, which means that somebody's interested maybe in buying it once it's ready. Um, how are you getting on with your suppliers for your idea? Uh, is it something you need people to make for you or to assemble for you? Again, anything like that is progress that you can put into your pitch because it's reducing the risk for the people that are interested in either investing or awarding you the prize. Uh, depending how far you've gone with your idea, you may have a bit of an idea now about your business model. Are you gonna sell it? Is it a subscription? Is it a lease? So again, put that in if it helps explain the story. And then also, particularly if you're after investment or you're talking about your plans, that's where the key milestones on your roadmap come in. You know, with this money, we're gonna hire, we're gonna improve our sales, etc. So you're explaining what it is you're gonna do with what you're asking for. Financial projections, if appropriate, again, depends a little bit on your idea, but certainly in an investment pitch, these would be key. What it is you need now and what it is that the opportunity presents for the investor or for the, the, the panel member uh, should you win. In other words, what are the returns? Is it, is it good for the investor? Are they going to make money? But also, is it good for the environment? Is it good for a particular demographic of people that are going to use it? And so on and so forth. So these are all the things to think about to put into your pitch. Obviously, then you can see that when you've got a five minute constraint, it really is, um, it really is tricky. And what I wanted to put at the bottom there and emphasize is with this particular competition, it's all about the feasibility of the idea. You need to have an idea that you can make happen and have an impact. That's really what they're going to be looking for, I think, uh, when it comes to picking a winner. Okay, last things. There is nothing better than practicing your pitch. Okay, so the more you practice, particularly as it's only five minutes long, the better you will be at delivering it. It means you're more confident. It means you're less likely to get twisted on your words. It means that you'll remember the points that you need to get across. And the more you've practiced, the more naturally you'll be able to tailor it to the audience in the future. So obviously the first few pitches you make, and this may be your first proper pitch at the competition, it's going to be hard and you know you may not have had much experience at doing this um, it's a case of just delivering it and delivering it coherently but over time the more you do it you'll be amazed how you can tweak and twist and and emphasize different points now once you embark on pitching your idea to multiple audiences over time you will find that you can also update it quite naturally so as you're making progress you'll be able to slot that into your pitch and that's really helpful as well um, and I think, you know, as I've said already, if you can use a prop or some other way of making it memorable, that will be really, really helpful. Because at the end of the day, particularly in this competition, remember that it, there's a vote to, um, to work out who the semi-finalists are. And then there's a panel discussion to actually pick the finalist or the winner, I should say. And 
you know, the, the only way the winner's going to win is if that panel can remember what you talked about and were inspired. So you have to be memorable. This little bit at the bottom is just really, you know, everybody has a different way of pitching and presenting. Some people will come across as very technologically savvy, very academic. It doesn't really matter. It's about being yourself and building on your own strengths. So whether that's using the terminology, having a different way of emphasizing when you speak, using facts and figures because you can remember them and they trip off your tongue and you're happy with that, or being a bit more descriptive. That's all up to you and you can try different approaches, yeah, um, when you're practicing see what it is you're comfortable with. Uh, the main thing is to, to, to have a pitch that you can deliver uh, without really making the mistake. Okay, that's all I wanted to cover. So apart from anything else, pitching is a really useful life skill, yeah? Whatever happens, you're gonna be pitching from now on, um, especially if you're studying and then you're gonna move on and, uh, into a career, you will always be pitching. You could be pitching yourself, your product, your business, some other kind of opportunity. So. Um, you know, make the most of the competition just to learn from it. Uh, and as I've said repeatedly through this, the big problem with pitches is they are constrained. Yeah. So you just can't go on waffling forever and ever and ever. Okay, I think that's all I need to say. So good luck. If you've got any questions or you want to ask about specific stuff, I can hang around for a bit. I'm more than happy to do that.